we can go ahead. All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone this evening to the Midwest Culturally Inclusive Conference. My name is Emily Steyer, and I'm a part of a team of folks that help host and facilitate the conference. Um, before we get started this evening, I want to go over a few logistical pieces. First are our community standards. Um, I will be sharing a full list of these in the chat. However, I'd like to verbalize a few of them. Um, so please obtain consent before taking any photos, screenshots, copying text, or sharing any content that is not yours um, this evening. Please make sure your microphone is muted when you are not speaking. And lastly, uh, when you are speaking, if you could please turn on your camera and identify yourself, um, speak clearly and slowly so that our live closed captioning service is as accurate as possible. Um, if you don't already see live closed captioning on your screen, please look for the more button and click view live transcript. Please message us in the chat for any assistance, but we do have live closed captioning available for all of our virtual sessions. Next, many of the sessions for MCIC will be recorded. This uh, event this evening is being recorded. You can find the recordings posted in Whova or on our Campus Climate YouTube page. The QR code on the screen links directly to our YouTube page. So I'll pause here for a second if anyone does want to bring that up on uh, their smartphone. Finally, if you have questions at any point during this event, please message one of the hosts using the Zoom chat feature. We will also be monitoring our Campus Climate email account if you'd like to reach out to us there this evening or at any point throughout the month. And finally, I would like to introduce the session this evening entitled The Growth of Young Adult Queer Media. Um, this session will be presented by Beck Hanner and Seth Riley. This presentation will highlight the growth of representation of LGBTQ plus folks in youth adult media. It will look at a combination of novels, television shows, and theater productions. Overarching themes that connect these forms of media will also be discussed. Some media that may be discussed include Carry On by Rainbow Rowell, The Prom by Bob Martian and Chad Begulin. I will now turn things over to Beck and Seth. Hello, I'm Beck. Um, I am a political science major at UWP and I'm the president of the Alliance for Gender and Sexuality and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And this is... I'm Seth Riley. Um, I'm a tech ed major with a theater minor on campus and uh, vice president of the Alliance. Um, my pronouns are he or they, don't care, use whichever you please. But welcome to our presentation. Um, so we are gonna talk about the growth of young adult queer media and Emily gave our introduction there and talked about what our blurb is about, but we'll get a little more into it here for you all. So we have an outline. We're gonna start with some key terms so you understand what we're talking about, story archetypes, and then we're going to go into written works, performed works, and then talk about the overarching themes that connect the written and performed works. So some key terms going on here. So queer is, we'll use that term pretty consistently throughout the presentation, but that means of relating to or being a person whose sexual orientation is not heterosexual and or whose gender identity is not cisgender. Um, previously, queer has been a derogatory term for people in the LGBTQ community, but recently it has been reclaimed as a very good general blanket term for everyone. Um, that is simpler to say than LGBT or LGBTQIA because some people get offended leaving out certain letters, and so a good blanket term to cover everyone is always appreciated. 
young adult is going to be used as a reference to a teenager or a person in the early years of adulthood, uh, especially used by publishers and librarians. If you go into the library, you'll see YA on novels that's specifying young adult. And then media is any form of communication, television, newspapers, magazines, the internet, all things that reach or influence people widely. And then canon is a clo clo colloquially. colloquially used to refer to something confirmed explicitly in the text or script of work. So it's like... It's something that is uh, specific, sp has specifically been confirmed by an author to be part of something. So if you're reading a book series, anything written by the author is canon. If you are seeing someone's ideas about how they think a character would act, that's not considered to be canon. So we're looking at um, the canon works of authors. So it's, it's an old use of the word that has come back into use recently. And then there's queer baiting, implying queerness without making it canon. So we'll use that term as well. So looking at how authors write characters that imply they're queer, but not actually saying those words out loud. And then cisgender, identifying as the gender you were assigned at birth, um, that as opposed to transgender and heterosexual, we didn't put it on there, but that means someone who is attracted to the opposite gender. So there's three main story archetypes that we'll talk about here. Um, there are stories that follow a queer character. That's a situation where the character's queerness is a major plot point. So that would be like coming out stories, queer romance novels. Those would be things where the fact that the main character is queer is a major part of the book. There's also characters who are queer, which is um, it's when the plot does not revolve around the fact that a character is queer. So it'll be stories where the main plot line might be some big fight against evil or something like that. And the fact that the characters are queer is present, but it's not one of the main focuses of the story. And a lot of times in this situation, just like when you meet people on the street, it's not immediately said that that person is queer. You might find that out later in conversation. They might mention a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend that would not be expected of that person's gender expression the like. And then queer coded characters, we kind of talked about that a little earlier. So not explicitly queer and they follow queer stereotypes. So they're written in a way that society has stereotypes on how somebody who is queer should act and behave. And they're written to follow those stereotypes without actually saying the words, this person is queer out loud. That is typically seen a lot in historical um, texts and older YA novels because typically you couldn't say someone was queer without having to kill your baby. So we're going to open up a whiteboard and we have a question for you all and you can either enter it in the chat, send it to us anonymously or write on the whiteboard, but where in media have you seen yourself represented? So to write on the whiteboard, you can just use your mouse to write words or you can put in text. There's a little, should be a little bar at the top of your screen for the whiteboard. Would you be willing to repeat the question that we're supposed to respond to again? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the question is, where have you seen yourself represented in media? So in shows and movies, books, TV shows. Um, music. Music, yeah. Any, any media that you've seen people like yourself represented in.
So we're getting some pretty pretty good responses here. Commercials, books, movies like Love, Simon. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, show on a Canadian station that featured a bi girl growing up. Owl House or Sex Education, Hidden Figures, most movies, books, and TV shows. All right. Uh, some from the chat, Q Force, movies. Uh, another one for Love, Simon, books, and some shows. And I would like to note that we definitely, even starting coming into this presentation up until the last minute, we're adding things that we thought of. Yep. We do not have an all-inclusive list. But these are some of the ones that we've watched and seen ourselves represented in and that we find important. Um, so some of the things you guys have mentioned may not be mentioned, but they are all really important. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so we're gonna. There we go. So start out with some written works. So one of the first books I really um, find important when understanding the growth of queer media, especially as it relates to YA um, media, is Annie on My Mind. It's about two um, lesbians and the story focuses on them being two young high school lesbians who are outed at their private school. Um, Liza is outed at her private school in this relationship with Annie, a girl she meets and they develop a romance, get engaged, go off to college and it follows how they're outed. And it's really one of the key story types you'll see in queer character stories. Um, being outed is also the same thing that happens in Simon versus the Homo Sapien agenda. Simon is outed by, um, he's blackmailed by Martin, who then outs him in front of the school. And it focuses on the repercussions Simon has for being outed and being queer. Red, White, and Royal Blue is actually a love story between two boys, and it does follow somewhat of their coming out as well. Coming out is really the touchstone that a lot of queer character books have because it's a universal theme that most gay people, queer people have to encounter because of the way the world is set up. Ruby Fruit Jungle is a histor more of a historical book like Annie on My Mind. It's not as modern as some of these current texts, but it features a young lesbian who is coming to terms with her sexuality, another coming out narrative. Um, and same with Felix Ever After. Felix and Ezra are coming to terms with their sexuality, but in this book, it's not the key point at all times, but it does follow Felix and Ezra as they come to terms with their gender identity rather than sexual identity. That's one of the key things that has come with the growth is most of the books, all of the books up until Felix Ever After that I've mentioned focus on the coming out story of being gay or lesbian or bisexual. And Felix Ever After focuses on somebody's gender expression and orientation and identity rather than their sexual um, orientation, which is a very modern in the last five years growth of queer media. So Carry On is one of the books we mentioned in the blurb and it's one of my favorites. I really enjoyed reading it. It's about magic and the main storyline is this kid, the chosen one, Simon, goes to magic school and learns all about magic. It's kind of like Harry Potter, but he falls in love with his roommate, a vampire named Baz, and they fight vampires and slay monsters. And it is a fantasy-based book where they just so happen to fall in love. It's not the key point. Um, Seth can talk a little bit more about Legend of Korra that you see there as well. So Legend of Korra was kind of a infamous show because uh, it was queer baiting to start with, but once they finished the show and published the graphic novels, um, they very, very quickly within, I believe the first 10 pages of the first graphic novel uh, confirmed that Cora and Asami were dating. They had the kiss scene that you can see there. Um, and that was very, that was a very big moment for a lot of people to see that represented on Nickelodeon, which is a kids network. Um, and then to see that in the graphic novels. Um, in a little bit older young adult media, it's The Priory of the Orange Tree. It's a very dense book, very good read, um, gaining a little bit of traction. 
as far as uh, popularity goes, but the main focus of the book had nothing to do with sexuality, but there were two very prominent characters in the book who were in love with each other. And because of the world setting, they didn't use terms such as lesbian or queer or gay, but that was what the relationship was. It was between two women. Um, again, in the Avatar universe, The Rise of Kyoshi, that was a prequel series to the um, Avatar The Last Airbender uh, television show, and that followed Kyoshi and Rangi, who were a couple, a lesbian couple in the book. And then the book Lumberjanes, which is a graphic novel that follows a group of, it's implied that they're Girl Scouts, but that's not the uh, the exact phrasing used, um, but they're at a sleepaway camp for the summer. It's a group of girls and two of them are in a relationship with each other. One of them is trans and it's just a very, it's a very good storyline. They come to terms with their own identities, but it's not the main focus. It's just something that happens along the way. So it does a very good job of realizing that, you know, we see a lot of the queer character stories where coming out and like that's the entire point of the novel. And then it kind of perpetuates the idea sometimes that being gay is someone's or being queer is someone's entire personality and then shows and books and graphic novels like these help break that up a little bit to say, hey, you know, people exist outside of their identity. People have multi multiple identities. Everyone is a multifaceted individual. And one of the key things to note with the characters who are queer in these books is a lot of them are fantasy based. They aren't related in this world. And a lot of that has to do with the social norms that are put onto books if they're trying to represent our world and the way we live is social norms have created the closet and being able to come out, which is why queer narratives of coming out stories are so prevalent in realistic books. Whereas fantasy series, they're not limited by the preconceived social norms that the American society values and are able to express ideas of gender, gender and sexuality in a much more fluid way. So then we get into queer coded and you see a lot of kind of more older YA books that are queer coded. To Kill a Mockingbird, um, a lot of people read that in high school. It's about a young girl named Scout and her neighbor Atticus. I read it when I was in high school, but Scout is portrayed as a tomboy. Tomboy is often a word used for girls who act like boys and don't follow the traditional gender um, norms. And so Scout is queer coded in that way where the language used to describe her is language that is also often used to describe queer people in society at that time. The color purple can be argued that it is directly a queer book because the two um, characters, Shug and Celie, do kiss, but it's never mentioned directly that they kiss or that they're queer. It's just her lips touched mine and it's very vague and then it fades off into blackness and it doesn't focus on that. It focuses about Celie's experience as a black woman in the South in, I believe it's around 19 something, I'm not quite sure, but it focuses on their relationship and more of the racial relationships in the South rather than the gender and sexuality um, feelings Seely and Shook have for each other. The Great Gatsby is another historical novel where characters are queer coded. Nick is very clearly into Jordan as well as he's seen to have um, fantasies about Gatsby himself and want to be with Gatsby in a way that's not traditionally seen. He's a very feminine man for this time period and spends a lot of time with other men, which isn't always traditional when he's not pursuing a relationship with another woman. Um, Harry Potter is queer coded. It's never mentioned directly in the books that Dumbledore is gay, but JK Rowling did confirm that he is queer. And there is a lot of controversy with the Harry Potter series because of JK Rowling's comments on trans folks and their rights. And she, since writing the books, has claimed that these characters are queer, and you can read through the story and pick up on it, but it's never explicitly mentioned in either the books or the movies, which is a huge issue by stating someone's queer after you've published material and then trying to go back and pull out the ideas and show people how they were queer isn't an accurate way to um, describe homosexuality and queer desire in a novel, especially a YA novel. Do you want to talk about Sherlock? 
Yeah. And so Sherlock Holmes is on there. Um, given the time period of Victorian London, there were a lot of different ways to um, to hint at whether or not someone was queer. Uh, one of the, the big stereotypes of the time was that uh, men smoke. And so queer men, they don't smoke at all. So you can see that Sherlock Holmes nearly constantly Historically, he's pictured with the large pipe and the two build hat. That's a very clear image that a lot of people have of the great detective of Sherlock Holmes. Um, and also the fact that Watson and Holmes live together, that was not exactly the standard at that point in time. And there was a lot of debate, especially with the, uh, the BBC show that came out recently, which is not necessarily a faithful representation of Arthur Conan Doyle's works, but there was a lot of um people who projected into the show that hey john and or john watson and sherlock holmes seem to be in a relationship they seem to be more than just roommates um, and that's kind of been a story that's gone on for a long time that idea that the two of them were more than simply roommates and that's there's queer coding comes to So now we'll move into some of the more performed works, that's uh, TV shows and musicals. So one of the major ones that we wanted to talk about was The Prom. Um, and that was a musical that's come out fairly recently and then was recently made into a movie. Um, and it followed a young lesbian couple, Emma and Alyssa. Emma was out to her school and Alyssa was not. And Emma wanted to bring Alyssa to the prom. And the school board decided that, or not the school board, sorry, the PTA, the Parent Teacher Alliance, decided that they would rather cancel prom than allow a lesbian couple to be present at it. So they did so. And then three uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, okay. my correction, Broadway stars uh, who were down on their luck decided that they were going to come to Indiana to champion the cause. So clearly, Emma and Alyssa were lesbian. Uh, Barry and Trent are very queerly written. A lot of the people in Broadway in the show are queer coded if they're not explicitly confirmed to be queer. Um, and that happens a lot in musicals kind of across the board. You can see that all over the place, queer coded characters. Um, and then in the prom also, they talk about conversion therapy. That's um, a recent topic that isn't often seen in YA media. That's not something that's brought up. Barry's parents actually offered him conversion therapy when he came out to them. And it goes through the growth of when Barry grew up and that's how his parents reacted to how when he came out to Emma coming out to her parents and her parents being okay with it to an extent, not threatening to remove her from her home, being open to working with her, even though they are in a small town in Indiana and there are still a lot of stereotypes. And then Love, Simon. We talked about Simon versus the Homo sapiens agenda and Love, Simon is basically the book, but in movie form. However, they take a lot of the key plot points and change them. And it's really important to notice that Love, Simon, the movie was really a keystone moment for a lot of young queer people who've noticed and were able to see themselves in this movie because it was a coming out story that was really accessible, not only to queer folks, but to allies as well. It gave people language and opened the gateway and it was right at a time when gay marriage was legalized was when it was published and written and it was um, fundamental in opening the doors for YA media to be taught in schools in this form. And it's really important to note how a book like that can then be made into a movie, which is now even made into a show. Um, they've made a show called Love Hector, which is a spinoff of Love, Simon. And it, that is trying to be more diverse in people of color's representation. And so continuously, they're trying to grow how media is represented by not only including a diverse array of queer identities, but also a diverse array of intersectional identities. So then we get into some characters who are queer. Uh, She-Ra has been a huge moment for a lot of people, especially a lot of young adults who are coming in, are coming into the world and kind of figuring out their own sexuality. Um, She-Ra and Katra are, are a relationship. There's Spinnerella and Natasa who are within, I think the first three episodes, 
you see a queer couple who are, it's a, my apologies, very healthy relationship for the two of them. Um, and then one of the main characters, Bo, his dads are shown to be gay in I think the second season, if I remember correctly. And they have a very healthy relationship between the two of them and raised 13 kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anyone does that, mad respect to them. <laughs> um, but it's shown to be a very healthy relationship. And so Shira was a very powerful show for a lot of people to see because it has such a wide amount of queer characters shown in it. Um, there are characters who are confirmed. There's also representations in other ways. Um, there is a character who is written as autistic and um, from my perspective, very well written in that way. Um, didn't fall into some of the horrible stereotypes that are associated with that, but portrayed it in an honest way. Um, that would be, I'm uh, forgetting her name now. Entrapta. Entrapta, thank you. Um, was coded as autistic and shown faithfully that way. And then into some uh, more stage works. She Kills Monsters has is a musical that is fairly recently produced, but it follows um, Agnes, whose family has died in a car crash. And in cleaning out her sister's room, she finds a Dungeons and Dragons module, an adventure written for Dungeons and Dragons that her sister wrote. And so she, in an attempt to learn more about her sister, decides to play through it and learns that her sister was queer and that she had a crush on a girl at the school that Agnes taught at, that Lily or that Tilly attended. Um, I met some of her friends who played D and D and just learned a lot more about her sister. And so that falls into a little bit of queer characters and a little bit of characters who are queer. Um, but it's a very popular new show, and it has been the source of some controversy from high schools that want to perform it and communities reacting poorly, but it's very well received when it is performed. I've, and it's very clearly written for high school audiences, yeah. which is another big moment is that it's written for um, people under the age of 18 rather than adults who typically this media has mm -hmm. been produced for. And it's very understandable that the way that all of the queer representation is written out. It's not hinted at very loosely. It's very clearly stated and um, in words that the target audience will understand to learn from it. Um, a very popular show in the last few years, Schitt's Creek, the main character, uh, David Rose, is pansexual. There's the famous scene of um, I only drink red wine and thought that you only drank red wine, red wine being a euphemism for men. And uh, David's response was, I prefer wine regardless of the label um, to sort of lightly say, hey, I like anybody, I just prefer their by their personality or anything along those lines, which is pansexual. Uh, Will and Grace, very famous older show that was one of the first major shows on TV that covered uh, queer themes. Uh, Will was obviously one of the main characters and was a very strong piece of queer representation for a lot of people. The issue with Will and Grace, though, is Will was very portrayed with the negative stereotypes and the very stereotypical view that um, gay men are very feminine and have a lot of money and are white. He was a white lawyer who was living in New York and lived in a very wealthy part of town and has a very nice bedroom and is able to afford all of the luxuries. So he's not, um, he has all of the other privilege that comes with his identities while also being a gay man. So it portrays um, the way society would have viewed it at that point, the best way to be queer was being a gay white man. And so that's an issue that a lot of people have with how Will and Grace portrays um, queer stereotypes because it really does rely on those to make a humorous sitcom and they make fun of Will's gayness consistently throughout the show. So 
but it was one of the first to be produced on TV and opened up the entire queer shows to be produced and put on media and air and take up the space that they didn't know they were allowed. And then there is Euphoria. This is really recent, season two. I believe the finale just came out the other day. Um, and season two in specific has been really influential with people. There are a lot of queer characters. Jules is transgender herself and a lot of her storyline focuses on how she's trying to um, become less of what the male gaze wants of her. And because she's a transgender woman, she's very well represented and passes very well. So she blends into society and not everyone recognizes she's transgender. They meet her. Um, it focuses on how she doesn't like how the male gaze looks at her now as a woman rather than how she used to be viewed. Um, the show really focuses on drugs and addiction and kind of de-glamorizes some ways of high school. And it's a high, it's focused on high schoolers who are definitely overdosing on drugs and not having the best lives, but it's a really diverse show that is trying to highlight some of the hard hitting issues that teenagers in America actually face while putting them right in your face so you can't look away, which some people really love and some people really can't stand and feel they're not doing it in the most appropriate way. And then there's Grey's Anatomy and this has been air for 15 seasons now. Um, it's a medical drama about um, Meredith Grey as she becomes a surgeon. And there are some touchstone queer relationships in there. Callie in Arizona is actually one of my favorites because of the way they're able to have a child together and then they go through a custody battle for said child and they come back together to decide to do 50-50 for the child. And it really goes through kind of what it looks like to have two moms and represents that young children can also be impacted and have um, relationships with two moms or two dads as well as Grey's Anatomy doesn't just have that representation it also gets up into hookup culture where there's queer folks just randomly hooking up and especially in the more recent seasons you see a lot more diversity and representation where they're intersectional identities rather than people just being queer and white or being um, a person of color and having no other defining factors they're becoming more fulfilled people with intersectional identities which is vital to Hey, Beck, um, your audio is cutting out a little bit sometimes. Just, uh, it's not constant, but just, just want to give you a heads up. Okay, thank you. Um, and then getting into some more queer coded characters in screen or uh, performed works. Rocky Horror Picture Show has long been a kind of a queer staple among a lot of people. There have been showings of it um my mom talked about going to see showings of it back in the 80s and 90s in madison with friends so it's been around for a good long while been a cult classic for a long time but it's kind of a, co a complicated representation because while there is the, the famous song at the end, I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania, it was portrayed that they were all aliens in order to get around the fact that showing queer people on TV was not okay. And Frankenfurter was shown to be this kind of insane mad scientist character who um, wasn't exactly all there in the head from how it was understood there's uh there's the rape scene that a lot of people like that is that is a problem there's no other way around it it's a very important part of history with the queer community and queer representation in media but at the same time it's also very complicated again just like will and grace kind mm -hmm. of falls into some of the stereotypes and falls into some of the um the not so good stereotypes and the the prejudices that people had against queer folks. Mm -hmm. um, back into Legend of Korra again, because in the show, as I said earlier, Korra was never confirmed to be queer in the body of the show. So Korra was a queer coded character. There was hints during the last season that she and Asami were together some 
glances between the two of them that seemed more than glances, that sort of thing. But there was no intimacy between them that confirmed anything. So Cora is regarded as a queer coded character in the show. Like I said before, in the in the graphic novels, it was confirmed very quickly. It was very clear that the writers wanted it to happen and someone else was telling them otherwise. Um, but Disney is very infamous, I will say, for having queer coded characters and in particular queer coded villains. Captain Hook in Peter Pan is this very flamboyant person, whereas the gaudiest possible outfit that he could, massive feather coming off of his cap, um, and is kind of comically queer coded in this very dramatized way. Uh, Ursula is quite famously designed after the drag queen Divine. Um, and again, Ursula is a villain. So it's kind of shown like this, this pattern that Disney has of showing queer coded villains seems to hint at people that queer people are not good. Now, if you look at a lot of uh, pop culture and a lot of like conversations online among the queer community, a lot of people really love these characters because they are queer and they see themselves represented. But at the same time, seeing yourself represented as a villain is not necessarily what someone would want, especially for little kids watching Disney movies. Uh, Scar in The Lion King, also queer coded. Jafar in Aladdin, very queer coded. Hades is so blatantly queer coded. All of the little drama, the gossip between he and fear and the conversations between uh, Hades and Megara and Hercules, they're very much portrayed as like the gay best friend kind of conversations. Um, clearly Hades and Megara are not friends, but that is the outlook of the situation. Um, Elsa is kind of a little bit on the fence because she's both the hero and the villain of her own story at different times, depending on the scene. Um, but she's very queer coded. Let it go is a lot of people read that as a coming out story. Mm -hmm. She's stopping hiding her powers, just like someone would stop hiding their queerness and letting out their true feelings. But at the same time, it's not a very great representation because when she let it go, she had to leave her entire society and hurt some of the people that she loved. And then going on, Isma from The Emperor's New Groove is queer coded. Peakley from Lilo and Stitch. Uh, Raya from Raya and the Last Dragon. Um, Mulan is another complicated one because Mulan is a historical figure and there's been a lot, a lot of historical people, women who dressed up as men or who, sorry, I shouldn't say dressed up, uh, who put on men's clothing to go to war. That has been a theme that's been seen over and over. And historically, there was never a word for transgender in the English language. Um, so that's up to interpretation. There was no great clear cut word for that in Mandarin and Chinese. Um, so we don't know, we can't go back in time and see if Mulan felt that they were transgender, but that's, so again, something that a lot of people see themselves represented in Mulan. Uh, Pinocchio is also queer coded in Disney's uh, animated films. You want to take I'll, ta I'll talk about Miss Frizzle. Um, <laughs> there's Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus. I grew up watching Miss Frizzle and she really just has this out there wild personality that a lot of people kind of relate to lesbian stereotypes. She wears a lot of big bright patterns, has these big chunky earrings, the way she dresses and talks, the fact that she doesn't have a husband, she's a single teacher, she works with kids. A lot of those are like older lesbian stereotypes where that's the only thing they could do and you know it's they've now rebooted um the magic school bus into a different version and her sister uh, cousin or someone comes and takes over the classroom because she went away for some reason but the way they portray her 
um, costume design character traits more than anything say that she's queer coded and it's representation for kids to like see that but there's never any words placed on it which is the issue because how do you know that's really somebody being queer if there's no words placed on it or no expressions that this is actually how they identified you're just reading into what our society is constructed as the queer gaze is what a queer person should look like um hairspray is another musical that um and movie that kind of has queer themes wilbur tracy's dad is played by a man in the show consistently um but people have stated that wilbur's um build just requires for him to be played by a man or for her to be played by a man and that she the character doesn't actually isn't actually a trans person but in the film it's kind of seen that way the way tracy's dad and her um, the way they have a relationship and a romantic interests um clearly states that there's something else going on and not everybody would love them because of who they are. I think the next slide is just for you. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about the other things coming out. So some of the coming out narrative, you see it in both written works and in movies. That's really one of the big themes that has become important is coming out stories give people a way to learn how to come out if they want to be somebody who's planning to come out of the closet or they're a young individual and this is just the first way they're experiencing and engaging with the idea that somebody can be part of the LGBT community. Um, as well as romance stories have become more popular and fantasy novels that allow for gender expression to be explored in a way that's not standardly seen in our society. Realistic novels really have to portray what's expected and the American standards and social values, whereas fantasy novels allow for authors to explore sexuality and gender in ways that we actually can't because of our constructed ideas and views. Like Beck said about the fantasy novels, if you if you watched on a lot of the uh, the queer characters versus uh, characters who are queer, most of the books and shows that we had on characters who are queer were fantasy, and almost all of the ones that we had as queer characters uh, where the plot revolves around their queerness were, like Beck said, they were realistic, they were in our world, they were coming out stories, they were romances. So that really makes it easier, and that's long been a way for people to discover things. Escapism in books is nothing new that's been going on for centuries. And we really see it with um, television and growth. I know Netflix, I think in every Netflix original, they at least have one queer character now. I think that's just kind of a thing they do. It's really exciting to see and be able to find it. And they also make shows that revolve strictly around queer characters like Q-Force where the whole storyline is about five queer characters and they have more than one identity represented. And so we really see the growth of young adult media happening in not only literature, which is exciting, but we see it in television because we have access to it more now than ever. And that's what's been the most important in this growth is there's an access to this information, which wasn't always there. Yeah, there's There are more queer characters in TV shows and movies and books now than there ever have been in the past. Um, there's studies to prove it, whose numbers I can't quote at the moment, but they're out there. Uh, GL AAD GLAD uh, did an analysis on percentages of how many characters were in television shows, in streamed media, in movies. They broke it down. It was a very interesting read. Um, sorry that I don't have the statistics for you all. But yes, like I said, there are more queer characters in TV than ever before. I think the number said about 12% of characters on TV queer, um, which is, I believe, below the percentage of LGBT new people in the population, but it's evening out. And that's really awesome to see, because if our media accurately represents the world we live in, that makes everyone much more willing to accept the world that we live in, the people that live around us. And it gives everybody the chance to find their identities and they're able to discover things they didn't know were there. And that's why YA is so important, is 
the young people are coming into our world and especially teenagers and middle schoolers reading these books for the first time and watching shows and understanding that this world is their world as well not just some fantasy world having the realistic examples are key to making sure that we have a future that's diverse and inclusive of everyone but i think that's about it do we have any questions What is a favorite book or TV show or movie uh, that is that includes queer characters or queer coded characters uh, that you two like? So, like, what is one of your favorites? I love Shira. I we've we've rewatched Shira. I've watched it like three times now. She's she's a lesbian power princess. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love Shira. It's so much fun. I like the fantasy element and like I definitely read fantasy books as I was a kid. So like seeing that and seeing myself kind of represented in that world is really neat. Um, and I like that it's on TV and not just a book anymore. I think that's the coolest part is it's on television now. It's not just in books that I have to read. I can see them like have visual representation as well. Oh, yeah. um, I recently read The Priory of the Orange Tree. I talked about that one earlier. It's a very good book very very dense um it's it's a read it's not just oh hey i think i'll read this this weekend it's a okay here's a book um but it's very good um uh, i am a sucker for fantasy so that's that's my vibe um but yeah shira i can thank back for that <laughs> we, we did our research it was actually kind of fun to do the research for this because we were watching a lot of shows and uh reading some queer media. I I had never read or seen She Kills Monsters before. And so that was just an awesome experience. I read it and now I got to find some recorded performances that I can watch to see the see the actual stage work. Um because obviously I'm a theater minor and that's my vibe. But um I definitely enjoyed that. And as someone who plays D D that makes it a little bit more near and dear to my heart. Well, and then there's the L word, which we totally didn't mention, but that's one of my guilty pleasure shows. Um, it's very based on lesbian stereotypes and a very graphic show to watch, but it's interesting to learn about the, all the historical stereotypes there. It's on Hulu, I believe, um, but that one is very good as well. Um, I believe Netflix in particular has a category on there that you can search that is queer mm -hmm. and it just pops up any show that has a queer person in it um and there's a lot i'm i'm pretty impressed with the amount of shows that are presenting more information about less known lesser known identities obviously like lgbt there's four identities right there that are the common ones lesbian gay bisexual transgender um, but there's shows that are popping up that have representation of everybody. Sex education, somebody mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately haven't gotten around to watching that yet, but I've heard really awesome things about the way that they represent uh, asexuality, which is one that really confuses a lot of people. Um, and there's plenty of other shows um, Oh, Bojack Horseman, very crass, uh, very adult humor on there, but they did a very faithful representation of asexuality in the character Todd. Um, there's a lot of people that I saw so much conversation online at about the time that that was confirmed on the show that people were just so happy to see someone represented in a show that was accurate and faithful to their identity Seems i had a question for you too oh go ahead mm -hmm. so um i'm gonna share a microaggression i don't it's not something that i personally believe in it's just something i've heard quite a bit um especially in recent years but i've heard a lot of commentary about how there's lgbtq plus or, or queer folks everywhere now like people are just coming out in droves um and i'm curious what your thoughts are about the perception of that 
in relation to the increase in media representation, right? Because I think part of me is wondering, are folks actually just coming out in droves for funsies or are people having access to depictions that they can relate to earlier than maybe many of us had growing up? I think it's a lot to do with access as well as the um, social culture and like political culture. Our political culture has changed dramatically. And the fact that gay marriage was legalized when it was and that it was such a short time frame in which it happened, people have access in a way they didn't. Um, queer people have always existed. There just wasn't always the language for it. And so having equal access and having broad access in the internet and being able to, I could walk into any bookstore and be like, I need a book on um, a queer character to teach my high school students for a uh, class. And there would be somebody at that bookstore who could most likely help me find three or four books and just being able to do that. Whereas before, you, any book you would find with that most of often would end in kill your gaze or something very tragic happens and people aren't, there's no positive representation. And so I think the positive representation and the access to how much representation there is, is what's really impactful, is it's not just negative anymore and it's easy to find. Um, and Bex mentioned kill you, the, the phrase kill your gaze a couple times. Um, that's the, the classic old stereotype in a lot of older media where um, any queer character couldn't have a happy ending. Um, they either got killed off in the end, they got their heart broken, they, something along those lines where they just had a horrible, tragic twist at the end that was like the, you can be gay, but you're gonna suffer for it at the end. And that's something that has not been seen in a lot of modern shows. Now we're moving far away from that, which is excellent. Because uh, it's really, really terrible to mm -hmm. to Caden's question. That has a lot to do with the amount of people coming out. Because now you're stopping seeing shows and movies and reading books where the queer people can live for a little while, but then, nope, not fun anymore. Some tragic twist that ruins everything. Mm -hmm. Now you're seeing these stories that end in happiness. she -Ra, there's nothing tragic about the outcomes for any of the characters in that show. Um, with, with the prom, there were good outcomes for everyone involved. With Korra, there were good outcomes um, for Korra and Asami. Like all of these representations, they're positive. They end positive. They start positive. They might get a little rocky along the way because every relationship does your relationship doesn't have ups and downs, that's non-standard. <laughs> and it's focus, a lot of it too, is that it's not focusing on all of the hardcore coming out stories that the main personality point of someone is that they're queer. There's characters that are queer and are just there and living their life and you find out 10 chapters into a book, 10 episodes into a movie, a show or whatever, that, oh, this person has two dads. We don't know Bo has two dads until season two, and it's just there and presented as normal. And that really has an impact as well. So it's just presented as part of the standard that society expects. It's not presented as weird and obscure. It's just there in the background. Yeah. And like Beck said, with, with not finding out until later in a story, um, I like to call that the grandmother paradox um, or the grandmother situation, because there's a lot of times when people might have family who is very homophobic or they they just don't understand and then someone in their life comes out and they they twist because they realize it's not other people it's people that we know and love it's people that they're human too when you don't get confirmed until later in a book that a character is queer you have time for the reader to fall in love with that character, to get an emotional connection to that character that they're not immediately walling off because they say, oh, that character's queer, I can't like them if they are a biased person to begin with. So when you have that situation where you can make a relationship with a character way before you learn something about them that maybe previously you wouldn't have accepted, but now that you know them and you've seen that they're a good person, 
it makes that much of a difference that you're like, hey, these people are good people. Maybe I'm wrong about some other things. So the fact that people are seeing those narratives, I think that also, to Aiden's earlier question, helps people with coming out. You see these stories where this person's living a good life. Their families are accepting once they come out because they realize, hey, I hate gays, but I don't hate my granddaughter or I don't hate my niece or nephew or daughter or son. So maybe other queer people are okay too. They usually are. (laughs) But that's something people got to figure out. Mm -hmm. I think the growth in young adult media is remarkable and I wish I had more access to it when I was younger. I really do. Do we have any other questions? It is, I think it's seven, it's 701. Mm -hmm. Any final questions for Seth and Beck? Okay. Well, thank you you. for coming. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, Thanks for sitting through our presentation. Mm -hmm. I hope you all learned a thing too, or at least saw some representation that you loved or have a new show to watch. Yeah. If you haven't seen She-Ra, go watch (laughs) She-Ra. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, have a great night, everyone. Um, I hope you join us tomorrow. We have two more virtual sessions, one at noon and one at six tomorrow as well. So I hope to see you there and throughout the rest of the month.